What is going on, on fans? Welcome to the Legion of Comics. This is Mark, and we're here for the very special stream today. We're putting the usual scheduling aside, and today is all about Ghost Machine, the biggest comic event of the year. We've been talking about it forever on this channel. It's finally right around the corner. Tomorrow is the big launch day, and we've got a very special show to kick it off. As always, a huge shout out to Big Time Collectibles. Be sure to check them out their website. Follow them on social media. They're always doing fantastic stuff from like cons, mystery boxes, monthly subscription services, a fantastic shop. And if you need anything cleaner press, check out my homie Justin over on Instagram. Let him know you found him via the channel. The link is in the description of all my videos. And as always, a huge shout out to my local comic shop, ABX Comics and Games. That's where I pick up all my new books. That's where I'll pick up all my Ghost Machine books tomorrow, as you should as well. If you're looking for a great entry level to comic collecting or tabletop gaming, they have a fantastic Facebook group. Very accessible for beginners and novices and veterans in the industry alike check that out so we're not going to waste any more time i'm going to bring in my main man with pots and pans my partner in crime none other than mr sector 2815 paul how's it going oh um i'm just a tad bit excited i think is how i would describe it rightfully yeah. so rightfully so this is a i mean i'm really excited I've been excited about tomorrow obviously um like beside myself excited that we're actually getting to kick it off in style today and have some very special guests joining us let's go ahead and bring them in and not waste any of their their time i know it's gotta be precious right now busy folks right here we have none other than legendary artists in the comics game mr brian hitch we also got another absolute legend in the game mr jason fabach how are y'all doing today yeah now gary is on the <laughs> he won't be making it today due to travel stuff and jeff johns will be joining us in just a few we'll bring him in as soon as we get here but welcome to the show guys i'm very excited y'all are here i know y'all are excited uh, for tomorrow yeah thanks for having us absolutely oh. and right on right on schedule uh the man behind it all the absolute <laughs> legend for anybody like me who's a big dc comics nerd uh, this is like the ultimate the ultimate treat for me right now for the first time ever on the channel and first time me ever getting to talk to him mr jeff johns what is going on hey guys sorry i'm a little late <laughs> dude it, it's fine like now everybody gets to see my reaction to you popping on live uh total total dc fanboy here Oh, cool. Yeah, he just he loves to make an entrance, does Jeff? <laughs> yeah, I was telling whatever, guys, whatever works. Yeah, I'll tell those guys. Uh, I'm for me, the ghost machine stuff has been so easy to get into. Even back to the Mad Ghost stuff, I was following it before Geiger mm -hmm. One dropped, simply because you and Jeff, uh, you and Gary Franks were attached to it. Like pretty much guaranteed quality, the dynamic duo of comic books, and I uh, thought that that was just amazing. And the CD Evolve is crazy, but. I know you just got here. But let's just dive right in. Like, can you explain to the viewers that might not know what is Ghost Machine and how it came to be? Oh my, well, first, hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> I Hit the ground I, running. Uh, well, look, nice to meet you guys. Um, yeah. Talk to you guys. Uh, I, thanks for having us on this show. I know this is a huge week for us because um, we've been working on this forever. Um, how it came about, uh, it came about super organically. Like Gary and I were working on Geiger after Doomsday Clock because Gary wanted to do something other than superheroes, which I was excited about. So we did some genre story with Geiger. And then Brian and I were talking about Red Coat and Jay and I were talking after Three Jokers about doing something. And Image was such a great place. We all started, we all started just talking about like what would it look like if we came together and it was first the four of us and then um and then we talked you know to pete and francis and ivan and everybody else and, and it suddenly like we were brainstorming names like what do we call this thing <laughs> and uh and eventually it just i think it took to, i mean at this point it's crazy to think of how long we've been working on it guys like mm. it's like I mean, it's it. The, the idea of the concept goes back a couple, at least a couple of years now, two two and a half years, like the first time we talked about it, and then it took us like a year and a half to, maybe even longer to really more than that actually, probably almost two years for us to really like build the business and look at it, work with people that you know we wanted to make it unlike anything that's ever hap uh, like happened in comics before. <laughs> still kind of familiar because you have like you know people like jay and brian who are at the top of their game doing creator own books and leaving but at the same time the co-ownership and and we all run it together and it, it, ghost machine just grew out of our collaboration and our passion for comics and 
the fact that we actually like each other. <laughs> that so how help, early, it? How uh, early was it on? Because I know like uh like there was variants for Geiger number one even with some of these other creators. How early on was it that y'all knew that y'all wanted to take Geiger into something so much larger than what it initially started as? We we started issue one with the unnamed timeline, but the how NM, did y'all really see it getting? The unnamed timeline actually wasn't until issue six. Mm. Um, and that was on purpose because I had ideas for other characters and like expanding the world. I thought it would be interesting to do a timeline. But that was really early, and it wasn't until Geiger was working, and then Brian and I were talking about Redcoat, and that character really grew out of just Brian and I, you know, talking about what we'd want to do, and then, then the timeline grew, and then it grew to then it grew differently because we didn't want when Jay and I were talking about Rook, we didn't want everything to be tied in so tightly that like Rook's in the future, and it's such a different kind of beast it's literally a different beast so like sci a sci-fi book um it's it's just in different in tone to like the unnamed which is more like genre heroes in different time periods and so we decided to make separate shared universes and that's where it started to kind of form and take shape we didn't have to have everything connect or nothing connect we could do kind of a mix of of that and so we came up with these four totally different universes like with the unnamed with brooke with the what Peter Tomasi and Francis Manipal are starting with the Rocket Fellers, and then Pete and Peter Snayberg with Hornsby and Halo with the Family Odysseys, and then we've got the Hyde Street stuff. That's our horror universe. That, that all that stuff kind of ties together. So we have these four separate shared universes, and it's given us a creative freedom to to do what we want and explore all these different corners of of genre. Now, touching on that red coat you mentioned, that's a. Uh... That was the really the first expansion we saw into the Geiger universe. We saw him first in the eighty-page giant. And that's what really first completely piqued my curiosity. And uh, Brian, like, can you touch on like where that character came from and uh, what we can look forward to? Because we're actually getting our first real comic issue with Red Coat number one tomorrow, and I believe it's a forty-eight pager, if I'm not mistaken. It was thirty-eight. Yeah, yeah. It's thirty-eight story pages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a great book. Yeah, it got a, it got a bit bigger than we planned, didn't it? <laughs> I blame you and me. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just saying before we went live that we keep feeding off each other with this stuff. It just yeah. I was I was drawing this double page spread today. Jeff wrote actually what was technically a quite an easy double page spread and I spent the day making it absolutely as difficult as I possibly could have. Uh just because I wanted it to be bigger and louder and noisier and still get across the effect he was asking for. So it just it, yeah, it would just keep wouldn't it be great if wouldn't it be great if we did then it goes backwards and forwards until something is just exploded. So, which is great fun. Um, it's always a challenge. I've saying, I've said it many times. This is probably the hardest I've worked in years, just because um, it's a challenge. There's uh, there aren't really many easy ways of doing red coat the way we want to do it because even even just looking up um, relatively accurate period costuming for the different periods we do the you can't just look outside and draw the cars you see on the streets or the, use the pictures I took in New York every time I visit um, because you have to know what a streetcar drawn by horses looks like and you have to know what that looks like inside and outside. You have to kind of get relative. And I, I like to be quite accurate. So I want Boston to look like Boston in 1890 and New York to look like New York. These are different places. I want them to feel different. So there's a lot of world building. And even though it's, magical and fantasy um an action adventure too i think environment is as important what is to me as character so uh yeah i want this to be i want this to be you feel like it's a huge budget looking thing uh, it really summer. does yeah. I, I i just the first time through the book i uh i noticed the extreme level of detail and i noticed it with your background specifically uh, there's a scene when, like, uh, I noticed a wall behind him and some of what was on the wall, which I'm just going to tell readers now. Make I'm not going to spoil anything, but watch for Easter eggs because there are Easter eggs hidden through these books, yeah. and they're not necessarily in reference to what could happen in the future, but it just shows that y'all are having a good time making these for one, which put a smile on my face. And then I noticed when I turned the page, the next panel, the distance that the main character is gone, I can find that same building behind him at a slightly different angle. I'm like, I can feel the motion. It's setting the the actual speed of the book, the pace of the book. I can tell the distance that's traveling. I'm like, dude, 
that's what comics are missing. Like you don't get that same level of detail. You don't get that same level of care. Like, and you can feel it in this experience. And I absolutely love that aspect of it. So you, you knocked that part out of the park. Yeah. Oh, and, 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 and one of the, one of the things that I've always enjoyed uh, about you, Brian, is you, you have a very cinematic type of a, of, mm-hmm. of the way that you draw, um, you know, with almost like a widescreen type of a thing. But one of the things I wanted to ask actually all three of you is um, coming from the world of create, you know, of, of corporate owned um, entities now doing your own. Does that have, has that, do you flex different creative muscles when you do your own, as opposed to if you're doing a company owned? I think, well, just from my point of view, I think there's, um, there's certainly a willingness to go a little bit further um, because the investment is much more personal. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't mean personal just for me. I mean, for all of us, because we're all, um, we're all really feeding off each other in lots right. of ways. We get excited by each other's books. We love reading each other's stuff. We love sharing artwork. It's inspirational all the time. Um, but actually, this this doesn't feel like creator ownership or corporate. What we're doing is actually something completely different mm-hmm. from both of those things. So uh, creator ownership is often, I mean, I've, I've dipped my foot in that particular water a couple of times. And it, it, it yes, there can be a partnership with another individual, but it does feel like you're an island in a very large, mm-hmm. you know, ocean doing that stuff. Um, this is not that. This is this is a you know a group of very like-minded creators and business people, uh, because as, as important as as all the creative opportunities are for all of us, um, and the comics we're making as, as a huge priority, we couldn't do it without the other half of the company, which are the mm-hmm. The other, you know, owners and operators right. of Ghost Machine, which are the business people, the editorial stuff, um, and all the executive side of things, because that's really what's making the company function. Um, so, yeah, I think we're all working a lot harder because we're all so much more invested in this creatively and commercially and especially mm-hmm. personally. Yeah, I, I, I echo that with Brian. One of the things coming together, we, we have a, we're on Signal, the whole company's on a Signal chat. And I love that chat because sometimes like I'll be gone from it for like for an hour and I'll look down, there's like 78 messages. I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? They're just talking about lunch. You know what I mean? What like? uh, or, or shoveling snow or whatever they're doing. And it's one of my, because we all got to spend so much time together in New York Comic Con in October, and some of us have known each other a long, long time, but to do it as a group and a team, that's, I think that was the most, uh, that was just the most surprising thing to me. Um, I thought it would be fun, but I didn't realize how fun it would be. And I didn't realize how it would feel like, you know, I remember like, uh, I loved working um, at DC. Some of my favorite times working there was with like with Grant and Mark and Greg on 52 or with, Mm -hmm. Pete Tomasi on Green Lantern Corps when we were going back and forth, like when we were really humming along and like, you know, it felt like you were collaborating and you were working together and everyone was excited about a, a, a corner of the DC universe. This feels like that, but amplified times like a thousand because everyone is this, everyone's invested in everything. Like I, every book I want, I'm excited about every single title because I know that everyone that is a part of Ghost Machine is putting all they've got into it. And because I certainly am, I haven't had this much fun writing in, I mean, years. And I love writing. I loved like, I loved writing like Batman Three Jokers and Doomsday Clock and Aquaman and stuff. But this is just a different level. And it is creator owned. So you do get, you know, and I are creators owned and you do get, uh, uh, there's a, it's not so much a freedom like, oh, I can finally do like a story about this because I feel like that's not really what it's about. It's it's creating from the ground up, but there is a depth. There's an ownership to it that you you do get more invested in it, which I haven't experienced a lot because I haven't done a lot of creator owned at all or, or even new stuff like this where we control all of it. But like, for example, with Redcoat, Brian and I, like we can get so deep into Simon Pure, the character, and his adventures and the supporting cast and where it's going and knowing that there's not going to be like another series where they reboot red coat and mm-hmm. the stories keep like we actually know when we eventually get there because it's an ongoing book we know the ending we know the very ending of the book mm-hmm. 
It's the journey there that's going to be so exciting. And the fact that we know what this journey, what this book's about, I tried to do that the best I could with Green Lantern when I wrote it for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. And I ended Green Lantern with this issue 20, which is one of my favorite things I've, uh, and I look back at comics, there's books I've written that I don't like and books I've written that I do like, just to say that. But Green Lantern 20, the Green Lantern run in general, I'm really proud of it. But that issue, that last issue 20, I tried to make it feel like as much of a final, final ending to Green Lantern as I possibly could, because you don't get these endings. You don't get these complete stories and in, in corporate owned comics because people take the characters in different directions. Some you right. like and some you don't like, you know, um, and you can't really control that. But in this, we can actually plot out our entire world building and character arcs and stories. And they feel richer because of that, because we know there, this is the version. There's only one rook. There's no like, hey, which rook is, hey, which rook book are you going to read this month, or, you know, which version of rook is this? This is this is the only version of rook, and I think there's something really pure and, and exciting about that for me. That that's new, and that combined with the personal relationships that I think all of us have made in this company, and the investment we have on every level, it's it's for me, it's the best time I've ever had in my entire career. I just want to do a little uh, rabbit hole real quick while you're here. I mean, this might be my only chance to get to tell you, but uh, as a huge Spectre fan and a Green Lantern fan, I'll, Green Lantern Rebirth absolutely impacted me in a way that is indescribable, that only comic book readers probably experience when I read that as a teenager. It was just, uh, it was, when Thank you brought you. Al back, it just, it was, and that art in there was just insane, like with I'm their right suits right. being all black like that for one, yeah. like this is just, it was nuts. But Jason... Same question to you. Like, how does the, the creator own hit you differently? Yeah, um, this is something I've always wanted to do, but wasn't ever sure, you know, if it, it would ever happen. And, and some of that is because you can you get comfortable at, at DC, you know, or Marvel. Like, you, you're comfortable with your paycheck. You're comfortable with the characters you're working on. Um, you know, for years, for me, it was a lot of, I had a lot of passion for the characters and the books that we were doing. And so, you know, when Jeff called and said like, let's do justice league, it was like, I felt ready to do a book like that. And I wanted to challenge myself. Or when we talked about three jokers, it was like, yeah, this is the, this is the next step I want to do. I want to do this book. I want to do something that's going to be special and, and hopefully one day remembered. And, and then we kind of got to the end of that and it was like, well, I, I don't really know what else I want to do. I feel like I've accomplished all of the goals I kind of set out for myself. And uh, now I want a new challenge. And uh, for me, it, I was kind of looking around at the landscape of everything and just thinking uh, everything just seems to be a rehash of, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 year old ideas that just keep they just keep putting up the same movies and the same thing and take this old seventies star Wars stuff and let's just make more movies. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I, I also felt that, and sorry if I'm going on a bit of a, uh, an angle here, but I also felt like a lot of the creators that are coming in to do a lot of these books and take on these, these properties did, didn't, weren't really paying it the, the, the kind of respect that it was due. And that's something that Jeff and I, um, I can attest to with Jeff is he always like, with the DC characters, it was always about respecting that legacy, but also finding ways to then take them further, add new interesting things to the story, but still respecting that classic legacy of the characters. And and I I I wanted I really felt compelled and and like a deep desire down in almost like in my soul. It was like I want to create something new, uh, new characters, new ideas, new stories, um, and create things that. I would have been really excited about when I, when I was, you know, uh, 14, 15 years old and reading comics and, and these ideas like Geiger and, and like red coat at Rook, like Rook comes right out of that because it was a character I've been messing around with this, this, this vision of this character since around that age. And so it's always been kind of there. And, 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 um, you know, you get to a certain point in your career where you can take little, uh, risks. You can take that gamble. You can step out, uh, almost take that leap of faith into the unknown uh, because they've had some success, and you know, uh, um, and 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 now we we can kind of do that and 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 make a go at this. Um, 
from the creative side of things, it's really, it's, it's a lot of fun because things kind of, there's a magic to the, to the creation process and, and things kind of just materialize. You might throw out a, an idea and then Jeff throws out another idea and then we kind of go back and forth and then all of a sudden we have a really cool hook or, or character or, or direction some sometimes like with rook, rook issue three we had like two directions we could have went with the story and we ended up choosing to go on one direction that we felt would be the better direction for now in this time in the book and, it, and it's going to pay off like like it's a lot of fun to see that kind of naturally come out of that and i know brian can attest to this too because he tells a lot of the stories about how these how simon it, it's like grown out of like these great conversations that you have sometimes even just jokes and and funny little quirkinesses with with us as creators it's like we kind of are pouring little bits and pieces of ourselves or our family members or or experiences and things into this and it 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 does really make for something special but all the while we are we are trying to make the best stories we can uh stories that we really would love to read stories that we feel uh, comic book readers would really love to read and um and we're really excited uh, about this the fact that all this stuff is coming out and we're, we're so excited I, i'm personally really excited to engage with readers who are going to pick this stuff up and want to read it and want to know more about the you like my 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 like i just want to go out there and just start shouting like yes we're going to do this we're going to do that but it's like <laughs> no no we got to like it's part of the journey is the is the surprise and and what's going to come next and how how is this going to happen and how's this character coming in here and, and did you really do that and and all this kind of stuff like that's part of the joy of this whole adventure and uh, it's the joy of the creation process and it just gets you fired up on a different level uh it's a different beast it all yeah, and then and that's one of the things I was I was I was thinking about because you mentioned you know that you you get put on these corporate things like you get put on Green Lantern and you know you already have Coast City and you know in Batman you already have Gotham City that universe is already there you know but you've been able to but you can do things you know like I mean the emotional the whole emotional spectrum that was a, a genius you know right. to do the emotional spectrum um, you know everything with the 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 Sinestro Corps War all of that um, whereas here you guys are basically you know yeah and it, with Batman, the Batman universe is already here. Here, you guys are creating this universe from the big bang of this universe, basically. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I mean, it's always been when I've, I've been at my most passionate, you know, the, the times where I've got to create or co-create, I mean, the authority and the ultimates, arguably the, still the most perennial things I've done. Um, but getting a chance to just do something fresh from the start. I mean, I know the ultimates was based pretty much on the Avengers, but it didn't feel like I was doing the Avengers when we did the ultimates. Um, but it's not that I, I mean, I'm pretty passionate about everything I've done in one form or another. I always put everything I can into whatever story I'm, I'm, I'm working on, but there's just something different about this stuff. There's just so much more invested in it. And, and it, it, it just comes out every time I sit down at my desk to, to work on it. it it's just, there's no day that's remotely like, I mean, yes, there's work cause you have to, you have to get stuff done. It doesn't feel like work. I don't have to you know try and keep myself here just to push through another page i just i can never wait to get on to the next page or the next issue or the there's so much we're talking about ahead uh, and you just think i just can't wait to get to this stuff and it's a long time since i've felt that i mean yeah, it, it, I, yeah. It, it's for like redco it's interesting because <clears throat> there's also something really fun and it's happened with everything rook I mean, Jay, Jay and I, Rook has evolved so much since our first conversation and even as we're working on the book. And Redco, specifically Simon, is involved. I, I mean, I, I've mentioned it a few times, but I love how he's evolved as a character mm -hmm. because he's evolved out of Brian and I just talking, <laughs> like literally yeah. just hanging out. Like, it's not even more like, let's talk about Redco for two hours. It's just us talking about everything, like just mm -hmm. getting to know each other even more. And then Red Coat suddenly Simon just he suddenly becomes more and more real and and a lot a lot of the humor in Red Coat just came out of like well I, I, it's it's hard to not talk to Brian and laugh like uh, <laughs> but I can't with it. so I'm like well it's just it just kind of seeped in there like I want to assume that's a compliment to Brian it is a very <laughs> it's, it's a huge compliment because laugh I love laughing uh, but it, 
we just have a good time working on all this stuff. And even when Jay and I were coming up with swine, it was like at first it was kind of a joke. Oh, let's do a pig guy. Like, and then it turned into like a real character. We're both like, oh, we love swine. Um, and kind of touching on Rook, I think that's kind of like with everything coming out, this is the first one that's not in the Geiger universe and talking about designs and everything. And Jason's art really brings stuff to life. And the uh, level of design alone in this book is tremendous. And I was kind of shocked. Like I'm, I'm a sci-fi guy, but I'm just like in incredibly already invested from Mad Ghost days and that. So like I was naturally just really excited for those. So it was kind of, it was kind of Rook that kind of surprised me the most. Cause I'm like, well, I wonder what can they do? Can they get me invested like that early? And I, I told Paul that I couldn't believe the stakes in issue one. Like it felt like a penultimate issue. Like where can they, like, where can these people go from here? That isn't death. And like the design of the world, the everything that's involved with it, it was just you can just like hang out on each page, and because you're trying to just understand, it is so vast. Where do you where do you pull from your like creative designs for your like your sci-fi ships, the even down to like the warden's helmets and everything? Like, what's your big inspiration? Because typically with sci-fi stuff, you can see where people like oh they watched Aliens growing up. I've I saw those pods before here, or that looks very Cameron-ish. But where where do you pull from? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I'm pulling from my my, my kind of I, I love that '70s sci-fi, like like original Star Wars um, and Alien, especially Alien. Uh, I love that the, the the design work that was done there, and everything's very square and kind of you know like and and used like a used universe kind of thing. I'm very attracted to that in science science fiction. Um, and I mean, I, I'm pulling from all kinds of stuff. Like if I have to draw a spaceship, it's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll look up like kind of some cool designs for spaceships. And there's lots of concept art that people have done for movies and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, well, I kind of like that. Shape, or I like that shape over here and I'll put that all together. And just, sometimes you just got to do something just cause you got to get the page done. And so you just go with the, whatever comes to mind when it comes to the helmets and whatnot, like Rook was kind of the master and we kind of designed, um, everything off of that i actually had my brother who's a 3d oh, um, nice. modeler he made like an actual like rook sculpt that's insane and yeah. he and i worked very closely to like make this like to, to design all the parts so that it had a flow to it and it kind of had a bird a bird-esque look with like the feathers coming off the top and it had a cool silhouette from different angles and <laughs> now did that come before the uh before ink to page or is that like uh, after you designed it already um it was kind of a little bit after i had some really rudimentary kind of designs and, and but we kind of honed it as we went along and that was kind of the original helmet and then from there when we started expanding out the the different designs um i i i a lot of the animal helmets are based around the animal skulls themselves because i think the skulls have these very because you you want that you want the helmet to have a coolness factor to it but also a little bit of an edge to it and so like <clears throat> Ursa's helmet, it's got, it looks, has that bare kind of uh, silhouette, but then there's little bits and pieces on the, on the nose and stuff like that, that look like a skull, uh, like a bear skull. And so it's like mixing that with, with the classical shape, because like a bear, like when you really look like, like at a, like a bear's face, it's very cute. That's why we have like teddy bears, you know, they, they have a very round <laughs> This roundish kind of shape to them. They're that's how people buy. They're, they're mm -hmm. scary when they're like roaring and whatnot, but really they they have a very like smooth and and very uh, pleasing aesthetic. How do you make that look kind of scary and dark? And and so I started looking at a lot of that uh, for inspiration. Then when it comes to the costuming and stuff like that, it's like a mix of like Mad Max, Star Wars, and World War One. A lot of the stuff is like I really love the a lot of the designs from uh, World War One army outfits and things like that, and so I pull from a lot of that. You see that with like Rook with like the tucked in pants into like boot like they're not really boots they're kind of like uh, uh, sh uh, shin protector kind of things that they used to wear in World War One to keep mud off and stuff like that out of their boots, and it's like pulling from that and and pulling from this whole used universe uh, part part sci-fi part combat. And and things just kind of evolve, and and as time has gone by, I've kind of leaned in more to, like, well, if this character is designed around a, 
you know, a pig, I'm going to really play that up. You know, I'm going to push it a little more than just keeping it subtle. Originally, everything I wanted it to be more subtle. And as we've gone through, we, I've, I've leaned more into it a little more and the, the whole aesthetic of it. But um, I'm always on the lookout for inspiration. And I got so many books. There's tons of books just laying everywhere. Science fiction design from like Sid Mead and, and Alien and video game stuff. And it's just it's grabbing from it to try and. But but also another thing, and sorry if I'm rambling, but like I love talking about this stuff. Yeah. Another thing though too is I'm trying to think all the time like how I need this world to feel lived in and believable. So like if if uh, yeah. if if these are if this is a city and it's uh, in a swamp on a built into a, a waterfall, it's like well how, how would they have built that? What would the buildings look like? What kind of materials would they use? All these sorts of things, and, and so that kind of informs me. And then it's like then there's other things that go into that too. Like, well, who is the animal protector of this area? So maybe I should work some of that care, that animal's design into the way that the buildings might look. So you really start like you're like putting all of these layers on top of each other to build something that eventually starts to feel a little more unique and pulled away from any other sci-fi that you've seen before. I think just the, the, the mashup of, of nature and animals with, science fiction technology is very unique and it, it brings about a lot of ideas just as you're designing things you just naturally things kind of flow out of out of those two worlds coming together yeah so how many uh how many wardens can we expect to see i know we've seen a couple in uh ghost machine one you know especially with the the og style character profile pages like the yeah. Which was fantastic little touch, by the way. And in the uh, NYCC promo stuff that came out, there were some that were teased that we haven't seen again. But how many wardens were were stranded on Exodus? Uh, uh quite a few. <laughs> you'll, see, you you'll, you'll, you know, one of the things Jay and I talk a lot about it is one of the things I love is that every every warden has a story, right? Who were they on Earth before they came there, um, and why were they assigned the animal they were assigned? Um, and what do they do with it? And that's that's just great story because yes. uh, and 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 when you see Rook number two, you'll see you'll be introduced to another one named Direwolf who 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 connects with her animals in a slightly different way. And she's you know she's the one who was actually training those the wardens, including Rook and Swine, train them um, to use these helmets. And she, so she's more experienced in it and has a different point of view than. Than Rook does on it. Um, She's invested in the planet, right? Yeah, and and it's really interesting. I think to unravel the you know all of us have a favorite animal. You know, yeah. I love that you were just asking question. What yeah. would your animal be? All of us have a favorite animal. Look, I wouldn't pick this as my as my as my. Uh, I, wouldn't be the, I wouldn't be the warden of giraffes. But when I was a kid, I loved giraffes because. <laughs> Imagine that yeah. helmet. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm sure my entire chat knows what yeah. mine would be. It was the only other uh, uh, name with a G that made that same sound that my name made. So I'm like, oh, you're finally there's something else out there, like Jeffrey the Giraffe from Toys R Us. But I, I would not, pick, I would not pick a giraffe. However, everyone has a favorite animal, and there's a reason for it because we see animals, we see ourselves in animal uh, in animals. We see aspects of who we want to be, who we don't want to be. Uh, we actually have a rooster, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> rooster. It's a hilarious design, by the way, um, because there's there's also humor in all humor in this too. Like we can't have everything just be so serious because life is funny. But um, but exploring that element of you know why we connect with animals and nature and what it all means, and that is something that's front and center in in uh in in rook exodus and it's it's going to be really flamingo i haven't we haven't thought about flamingo that, that's, but that's, that's me all day that's exactly. my spirit animal but it's because me and my wife have like like great memories tied to one in an experience like you say we always have something yeah. within an animal that ties us in some way a great that's memory cool. or something because you think about like because when the helmets we, we talk a little about a little bit about it in the first issue with what's called instinct influence where you know, you open up your pathways, your neural pathways to the animals. This helmet, that's what this does. And you're sending your your commands and thoughts to them. But there's also a feedback that comes back to them, back to you from them. 
It'd be and, funny to see the flamingo warden can only look at you sideways. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you start to think, Mark, like, okay, what, what, what is a personality of a flamingo? What do they do? Right. They and, don't think they stand on one leg. leg. Yeah, they all that, stand that, on one leg, and yeah, that, that's that's going to influence who who the warden is. Like mm -hmm. every animal has, a, there's a personality to every animal, and when you think about and what they do and why they what how they operate and and that that that's really interesting to explore. We've had fun just starting to explore that. Because if you look at Rook, he is he is a scavenger. He is trying to fly away from this planet. He's a bird, you know. He's a bird who's grounded. And we we were talking before about you know creating the world the world from scratch. But one of the things that I really love is you also, uh, I'm, I don't know if intentional a lot, but you also seem to be bringing into aspects of what what has made comics fun for for centuries or decades basically i mean you have from the from the design with the checkerboard on the on the banner to um you know the the who's who um you know uh sheets on everybody um to the old 50s ads that you're using in hyde park you know those type of things you know all of that is what has made comics fun for years and years and years and it looks like you're also trying to kind of do a nod to that we, we we are for sure. There's some nostalgia in there. I mean, the, the checkerboard. I like. I mean, I I grew up on DC comic comics, mm -hmm. but I read my uncle's old ones that had checkerboards. And when they ever had a checkerboard, I always thought they were really good comics. Mm -hmm. So I just like that checkerboard. But it also, yeah, that checkerboard. It also is nice because you see it on the stands, and it's for the unnamed books. It, it mm -hmm. sets the unnamed books apart. Oh, nice, nine eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, and then things like the you know like Hyde Street's ads and um um and you know the, the and just picking animals having fun with it but it is mm -hmm. fun we're supposed to have fun this is i mean ghost machine is we're not the most serious group of people uh, <laughs> when we get together uh brian <laughs> brian and i went on like a two hour we dragged may tall with us mm -hmm. went on a two hour wine hunt when we were in orlando megacon um Real successful it was very yes. successful mm -hmm. very successful that's uh, what matters uh, but it was it was just we have we have a good time together and so our content reflects honestly it reflects who we are as as, as people mm -hmm. so you know that uh like the one thing that i've absolutely loved about this for all right so i grew up in comics my dad's collected since 63 i was raised in my lcs my first job was my comic shop and everything so for me comics are like way more than a financial investment but one thing that's always fun about this hobby is debating things from like who can beat who uh, what someone's first appearance, you know, there's a classic Hulk 180 or 181 thing. I got to tell y'all, y'all absolutely triggered me when y'all put out Ghost Machine number one and decided to assign first appearances for us, which back in the day, like trading cards would do that, you know, and ultimately the market will decide. But uh, it, it pointed out something that I wasn't sure of in Junkyard Joe number six. It ended in a huge fashion, which there might be people that haven't read it, and I'm giving a complete <laughs> volume one trade paperback away today so i won't spoil it but at the end there's a silhouetted moment in one panel small little silhouette back there no rhyme or reason to what character it could be and y'all named that in your ghost machine number one the first appearance of that character which i thought was bold move because mm -hmm. really it wasn't until ground zero issue two that we even saw who that character was and we're not even able to connect those dots till later but uh, where where do y'all come like come up with the idea of assigning first appearances and stuff like that? Because you you know, I mean, I know y'all are going story first, but you know, there's so much more in the aspect of comics and collecting and all that. So was that like a well thought out plan, or did someone like, oh wait, we put him over there? No, that I mean, one of the things with that one, Ghost Machine one shot, we were all very specific about making sure that it was as new reader friendly as possible, <laughs> right? So as new reader friendly as possible. So introduced all the characters, but those who's who pages, I love those who's who pages, yeah, I love them. pages, the hand Marvel handbook pages, like yep. those are all so helpful for me when I was a kid reading comics. And so not only do we have them, yeah, that's so that's Barney gets one in Geiger number one. Yep. Yes, sir. We're going we're gonna to continue. Um, we continue those. Some of them uh, we're going to continue those like in red coat one, Simon has his, we, we, we show that one again, but then red coat two, we're going to do Albert Einstein. So we're going to, we're going to start to introduce all the characters and have their, there's a, there's a big character named Nate, Nate, <laughs> his name's Nate in Geiger one. And he has a profile in issue two. So we, we really have, uh, we want to continue those who's who pages, those Marvel handbook universe pages mm -hmm. as, we, as we go through the issues, because, you know they're they're cool. They're helpful. Like I like that Barney, the two-headed mm -hmm. dog or wolf 
Yeah, great. Yeah, Gary. Barney, Barney's tough. He uh, he has his his time to shine too. And Geiger but that whole one. thing though, in, in Ghost Machine, I, I think I, I saw somewhere that you said that 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 whole argument of a dog or a wolf came out of something that you and Gary had, right? It did yeah, it did. Gary, yeah, I was like, oh, his dog, and Gary's like, he's a wolf, he's a wolf. I'm like, I know he's a wolf, but I, he's a dog. Like, <laughs> but yeah, but but anyway, uh, um, you know, the first appearances, Mark, when we were putting those together we just were like oh well northerner appeared here so we're making that his first appearance because he did it's also kind of fun because people who haven't read that can go wait i want to go see what that is mm -hmm. you know yeah. I, like, I like that red coast first appearance is actually in guy gary page giant number one i do too and i've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for tomorrow <laughs> because it was way back in 80 page giant number one i was telling brian before the stream uh uh, he wasn't familiar with it, but if, if y'all haven't heard of the Key Collector app, it's like the go-to comic app for comic book collectors, especially if they go to cons. It tells you the first appearance of this and that, so when you're hunting, it's easy, and you can kind of get generic values. But uh, I took to a social media campaign some months back to get uh, Redcoat's first appearances added to Key Collector, because I knew this mm -hmm. is going to be big, mm -hmm. and I, I still believe no matter how big it's going to be, it deserves to be even bigger. So, like, I, I wanted to see them in there because uh, Paul hosts a, a, a bi-weekly game show called Guess That Key, just 20 questions, live show, having fun. And the only stipulation to it is whatever key comic you bring, it has to be in that app so that it's universal for everyone who attends. So I went on a campaign to start getting it to catch up to the Ghost Machine stuff. So I was kind of curious about those first appearances because uh, despite what y'all write on those pages, I'm letting you know now we are going to determine it for you. As the market, <laughs> I will, we'll, Mark, we will, we will revise our who's who pages. <laughs> I, I applied the classic uh, first cameo, second cameo, first full. You know, the long drawn out version of yeah. first appearances. Sergeant, Sergeant Rock is one of the hardest ones because he there's like a pre Sergeant Rock, then there's mm -hmm. a early Sergeant Rock, then another like three issues later is a big. I, I tried to buy his first appearance and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, he's a fantastic character. Talk about, uh, I don't know if you read it, but that. Sergeant Rock the series they did here recently that Bruce Campbell actually helped write just a six page mini series. It was a blast. I, I own like four or five pages of art from that. No, oh, no. Uh, you own the Frank Quitely cover that he did? It was insane. No, like, I, I, you I gotta own look it, that up. Eduardo Riso art, like four or five pages <clears> that I bought. Yeah, it was it was really fun. So, so tomorrow is uh, Ghost Machine Day. We get the three the three comics, right? Um, for anyone who maybe um, hasn't heard or doesn't, um, do they need to go back and read Geiger and the eighty page giant and Ghost Machine? Um, I'm assuming that you can jump on at at issue number one with all these. You can you can jump on with issue one. The cool thing is, if you want to read more, there's two trades. There's a Geiger trade, a Junkyard Joe mm -hmm. trade, and the Ghost Machine one shot. But that's only if you want to. Mm -hmm. I do recommend the books because I think they're good. Absolutely. But you don't need to read anything. You know, Rook exit like Rook, you you're right, you jump right in. Red coat one, you jump right in. Geiger, even Geiger one, you can jump right in. You don't have to have read anything. But even if even if you're like, well, I don't, you know, I, I want to read more, there's only another, there's only a trade of Geiger to read. Right. Right. And absolutely. And if you have if you haven't search them out go back and search them out but the other thing though too is is if you have been reading them i think all these ones will pay off even more these you know because if you read ghost machine there were so many things in ghost machine that allude to what's coming up in all these different series that you can't help but be psyched for them yeah a couple points real quick we just mentioned them so if you're in the chat we're not going to draw it out but uh, if you make sure you put in hashtag ghost machine this stack here with volume one of those trades and the 80 page giant will be given away quickly toward the end of the stream so uh, if you're in and out of the stream, make sure you drop that hashtag. And uh, I know Circumstances mentioned it earlier and talking about like kind of going, like mentioned going back and reading. He said one of his favorite style of writing is where the beginning or the end of the book is in the beginning the whole time. After I read Junkyard Joe, I revisited Geiger because uh, we were first introduced to Junkyard Joe in Geiger. And it actually like brought an entire different emotional experience when after the fight with Geiger and Junkyard Joe, when Joe is shutting down, you get one panel, one weird panel, if that's the first thing you read, where you just flash to this old gentleman there and you're like, who the hell is that? But then you read Junkyard Joe and you go back and read it, you're like, oh my God, that's muddy. Mm -hmm. And it just absolutely changes the entire context of the fight that this isn't a mindless robot. This is, this is, this is a victim right now. Like it was tragic. And that just has me so excited for what's to come because, you know, Jeff, you've always been 
very uniquely fantastic at calling back in comics. Mm -hmm. Like you can do it with a, an industry that has 80 years of history. I'm so excited to see what you do when it's all starting from you and moving forward. Uh, this is just going to be huge. And that timeline just has me just so excited knowing that like it's, it's already done. You've already created not yeah. an 80 page, an 80 year universe, but a 200 year old universe yeah. to play with. I'm like, that's, it's it's fun too because we have the the character at the end of the timeline and the character at the beginning of the timeline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now to bring them together. Yep. Uh, and now we fill in the the middle, which is really fun. So when can we expect some? Uh, I mean, I know you can't get into too much spoilers, but there's a lot of different stuff named in between there. You have like the first ghost. We've we now have seen the northerner. Are all of these characters named on that timeline specifically going to have their own standalone title, or is this just characters we can expect to see? I don't want to reveal that just yet because we're just about mm -hmm. one season. But I will say this, Mark, is um, if you look at the ti the timelines revised in the Geiger in, number one, Geiger one and Red Coat one, mm -hmm. um, and you start to see it get filled in more and more. But it, you will see Junkyard Joe again in Geiger. You'll see Northern and Red Coat, First Ghost. Mm -hmm. You know, Brad and I are working on right now. Like all this stuff, all the like we want the characters in the books to stand alone. But we also they're also sharing a timeline and that timeline is, you know, the, these are all, all characters are born out of war. Right. Because war, right. mm -hmm. war, war, war will bond people like like um, like no, in no other way. And, and war also will destroy people or force them to rebuild themselves or haunt them. And that's really what the. I love all these comments, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm hoping. I'm hoping for some, you know, maybe down the road a little bit, maybe some mini series or something, you know, the unnamed war or the unknown war, um, where we get all the people together uh, in some sort of a mini series. Maybe the first big um, uh, Ghost Machine crossover. No, I'm yeah, not but if you do that, you've got to you've got to earn that. It's not something right, you right, exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I don't I don't want to I don't expect an answer, but like the way that Junkyard Joe ended, it almost to me feels like these characters would almost have to be introduced, come together over a common thread of what started this mm -hmm. unknown war and try mm -hmm. to do something about it. Mm -hmm. That's just that's just what I think. I would I'm so excited for you guys to keep reading all these books. Yeah, because we know yeah. the answers to these. Right, exactly. And we know that Junkyard Joe is coming back in issue number three. That was in the solicitations yeah. last week. Jersey yeah. Man. Yeah. 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 And by the way, you guys are gonna see like uh in Rook and Greg Coat in Red Coat and Geiger, Junker, every there's there's so many things that will make more sense as the stories go because we'll reveal what they all mean. There's nothing mm -hmm. that's an accident. Easter egg's the wrong thing because it's really a story point. It's just you won't recognize the significance of it, like the the flash to muddy right. story hits, and you'll be like, "Oh, that's what this is." What? And but it's all it's all as trying to build is it's it's emotional, right? right? It's it's all about character. It's all about exploring what it is to be alive. It's all about choices and and sacrifice and love and and anger and it's all about it's all about just people. And that's the most important thing for all of us is that these books are grounded in real emotion. So you really feel you really feel for these characters and you can see yourself in them and you can reflect upon what they're going through. And and that's the that's the key to all of it. Now, we've yeah, seen I mean, a lot of people mention it real quick, and I do want to touch on it before we forget or run out of time. But Hyde Street, another one that I'm ridiculously excited about. Ivan Reese getting announced as for as Ghost Machine. I lost my mind, started blowing people up. I like called Paul. Uh, he, that's another creator and another artist that I follow. Like I would, he thanks to him, I stayed on Bendis's run of Superman, and because I love Superman, and I followed him to World's Finest, followed him to like wherever he goes, I follow his art because I, it just to me it captivates that childhood feeling of what comic book superhero art should look like and he has a, his own unique style and when i got into hyde street again i was of course i'm going to love the art but the story absolutely tricked me out like it was it was i'm so interested and paul touched on it with the old ads and everything it's kind of like you're bringing the old ad pages to life and finding a way to string a story between them but uh, it was that comics pro retailer summit this year that y'all announced the official release date for that if you want to touch on that and mention it sure hyde street's out in october um Ivan's artwork, you know, we all send each other stuff and mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there those, there's those ads. Those mm -hmm. all tie to the, the, every one of those ads actually ties to a character that 
that lives on Hyde Street. I, yeah, I, 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 I poured I, I poured over it like three times. We're getting yeah, every single are, one. Yeah. They're all they're all tied in. That, those two characters that we introduce in these there's two specific characters that play a big role in Hyde Street that we introduce in that that small page. Or one is Mister X Ray, mm -hmm. um, and uh, who you'll learn about, and the other is named Pranky, the world's most dangerous Boy Scout. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. he was creepy. Yeah, he, that, 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 kid's, that kid's a lot of fun to a lot of fun to write, um, and uh, and you'll learn. I don't want to spoil anything in it because it's it's not till October, but issue one will issue one will open up this thing in a way that nobody's going to expect. Nice. Uh, and you were talking about you know the, the everything is in there for a reason. It's funny you say it because I I read the Ghost Machine uh, issue like four times, looking at every single line that you wrote. And I'm like, okay, you know what? You wrote one line. It was it seemed like it was a quick line, but you said like he doesn't really know what happened between the time he dies and the time he comes back to life. I'm like, that would make a great story to find out what happens between the time he dies and the time he comes back to life. <laughs> they might we'll answer it in issue. We'll one. Yeah, we will actually see that. Okay, <laughs> I didn't get to read the issues like Mark did. So, <laughs> so uh, we're running out of time here. I do want to ask, like, uh, when y'all did the huge surprise NYCC pop up and announcement, that changed the entire dynamic of my weekend. That weekend, I just mm -hmm. had uh, my my homie who was there, Flo Dameron from the Bada Boom Podcast. That's one of my buddies, and uh, you know, he was in the panel floor. He was sending me everything. He was picking me up stuff getting everything signed from you guys for me and everything. And uh, one thing uh, he, he also did was made sure to send me any like online detail stuff y'all were dropping along the way. And y'all cut the coolest promo that y'all put up on social media. I mean, like legitimately, not just like, oh, that's well done. No, that was actually cool. Like the music, mm -hmm. how exciting it was, you know, creators, you know, characters you'll love. And in there, there is a one second cut scene that as soon as I saw it, I said, Paul's rewind screen record slow-mo yeah that's that's tv show concept footage right there and it's literally straight off the pages of a geiger cover of him flying through the air at a convoy leaving landing on the hood and looking up and i lost my mind and i know that flow because i made sure he mentioned it to you when uh, you were on his uh, podcast the first time but can you tell us anything about i believe it's paramount that has the uh, option for this show yeah. Uh, first off, Mark, I have to say, I think if we went to high school together, you would have been my best friend. <laughs> I love your energy and your excitement on this stuff because it's it's very infectious, but I also share it. So I really appreciate how passionate you are about this stuff. Yeah, you uh, thank my dad for that. That's, that's awesome. He, I, 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 just, I just love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> Mark has but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh my, uh, uh, the, the the Geiger TV show. So it's at Paramount. I've, the script is finished, which I wrote. Um, a, a director named Justin Simeon's um, going to direct it. And we're just, you know, the the strike, unfortunately, put a pause in everything. So we're just getting ready. Hopefully we'll, if, if everything goes as planned, hopefully we'll be shooting, you know, I'd say, you know, we'll be writing and shooting, you know, top of next year. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe end of this year, but probably top of next year. My, that, that'd be my hope. Yeah. So we'll and see what, what a happens. unique opportunity as well with the the way that the Geiger universe exists with the timeline. Like you can run a season, and then season two isn't even necessarily Geiger. Season two is Redcoat, or season two is Junkyard Joe, or whatever. You know, I mean, dude, there's the creative process and the way that you can build that out is unique. In a in a time where we now have like these connected cinematic universes that have you know mileage may vary, might be getting tired. That is a very unique angle to be able to approach it if you even wanted to do it that way kind of thing but there's a we're lot of potential being, with that we're being really careful with like I, I call it over over slate planning which i don't like a lot of people mm -hmm. over slate plan and that's why we want geiger and redcoat and rook to be great books on their own it's Most all about them. just a great book like redcoat is a great book a great world a great character and you can just read redcoat the hope is that you like it so much you want to read all the Ghost Machine books, but you can just read Red Coat and really feel a unique tonal tonal experience that is very different from Rook, very different from Geiger. That's why all three issues are out on the same day tomorrow is because we wanted people to experience Ghost Machine is not the same thing. Ghost mm -hmm. Machine will offer a lot of different types of stories, but they will all be told with beautiful artwork and crafted and, and written in a very hopefully wonderfully engaging and emotional way. 
and you have the rollout throughout the rest of the year too, which is like is perfect. I think you know if if if, if you can't get enough with the three that you have, well, just wait a month or another two months because there'll be more gold machine, you know, coming for you. Yeah, we've got like I, I like that we have you know we're gonna have six months of Geiger, Redcoat, and Rook before we launch the next wave of books, mm -hmm. and I I'm excited to talk to you, you said guys. Books, plural. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry to talk to you guys in six months because we like here. <laughs> Once this stuff's out and there's like mm -hmm. real kind of, I'm so excited for the books to be out because people can finally under like meet the characters for real, um, and, and particularly Red Coat and Rook because they're brand new. Well, I'm excited for that Geiger TV show. I, I love comics, I love movies, and I got to tell you, uh, the best TV show, superhero related of the past decade, I think is is has got to be Star Girl. Like as a, if you if you're coming from a place of of a fan, of for like the JSA and the character, you can the most careful attention detail like that was that was it. I don't know how many people I got to jump on that show, which it was a it was a horrible rollout for that show with the unfortunate like dissolving of the DC Universe app and the dual streaming and everything happened to find a new home. But that show by season three picked up so many new viewers. It was one of those things like you know, you think you don't want to watch it, but watch how you feel after episode one, you know, you just couldn't mm -hmm. stop. And mm -hmm. I saw, I think it was you that put up a post that had a couple of slides on it and the shade was on there. Yeah. How the hell the shade becomes a fan favorite mm -hmm. just is beyond me. Like me and my wife were audibly yelling at the TV, rooting for that guy to not die at parts. Like, like I can't wait to see you bring that kind of care for a character over to the Geiger universe if we get to see that on screen as well because we all know how uh, close star girl is to you and now all of these characters belong to you as well so can't wait to see what happens we're all excited about it a lot very much yeah. but I'm, thanks for watching star girl but i'm really proud of that oh, sure, yeah. credit it was incredible you should be proud of it i know you're proud of the car <laughs> i do drive that car around <laughs> <That's right. laughs> in the pictures yeah. he does drive that car around they must, they, must, they must feel the same way yeah i like seeing it so it's pretty cool just remind everyone drop the hashtag it's gonna be a quick giveaway i'm going to just pop it up and spin it here in just a minute uh no no waiting around on that but uh, what what's can we expect next? We know Hyde Street is slated next October release date. But uh, timeline wise, what we haven't even touched on. It, but the horror universe have y'all officially named that one yet? Yeah, Hyde Street. It's, high, it's that's high the, that's the name of the actual universe. Yes. Okay. So devour, devour, um, mm -hmm. and so uh, and the Solus, Yeah, are going to be both connected to Hyde Street, and that'll make more sense when we get closer to that. And then in November. Uh, Peter Tomasi with Francis Manipal and Peter Snayberg are launching the Family Odysseys book. Family Odysseys, yeah. Pocket Fellers and Hornsby and Halo. Yeah, Hornsby and Halo, that was a fun little read. It one didn't get me as excited as the rest, but I'm a Jack Kirby DC fan, so anything that reminds me of the new gods, I'm in. So uh, it had that total, uh, we're going yeah. to trade kids here. Let's do it. And yeah, yeah. Pete, Pete seemed like the perfect guy to write it. I mean, everything he did with Super Sons and everything, you know, he's like, he, he has that voice. He loves it. He came up with that idea in New York. He was just like, oh, I really have this idea. And he just pitched, like, that's how nice it is. He just pitched it to all of us. I think, Brian, you, you and I were sitting together when he did. Can't yeah, it, we just knew that that Peter Snabo was coming in and Pete yeah. was sitting there saying, you know, I, I just really don't know because he's ready to go. I don't know what we could, but I've got, wait a minute, there's this. And he literally, in, t in the course of a mouthful of, you know, beer, he had the whole thing. Yeah. It was just, it was just one of those like <laughs> it was really cool yeah. instantaneous things, and you know, before the round of drinks was over, he was ready to go. Let's go. I keep seeing this reoccurring comment. Now I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of Heroes Convention in North Carolina, as it's like the last true comic convention where uh, comic books come mm -hmm. first and foremost. I know y'all signed an exclusive deal with, I believe it was Fan Expo for eight appearances over the next year. Yep. Uh, and that, that, along with that deal came eight exclusives as well, which appreciate that. Now I got to hunt stuff down for places I won't be at. But uh, <laughs> is there any opportunity to get y'all at Heroes Con? Because when it comes to like, uh, like, like the YouTube sphere, like the online sphere, like that's become our go-to place. We have over 40 content creators of different, like we, a lot of us come on here just to hang out and have fun and enjoy the hobby. You know, we're not trying to make a buck on here, but we converge on Heroes. And man, to get y'all there, that would be life-changing. All, all they got to do is ask us for next year. I'll make sure that they know that because we uh we did uh we just did a social media push and started tagging them on uh, artist John Jang's post and they reached out to him that day and booked him that day and that was late in it so they listened to the fans so it's a great great convention. When is it, really, 
it's a Father's Day weekend every year, June 16th through 18th, I think, this year. I can actually tell you real quick. Uh, I got it right here because I'm part of this uh, thing called Comics Curing Cancer. Every year we put on an event right here on YouTube, and we're affiliated with the American Cancer Society. The first year we did about $25,000. Last year we did fifty. All money, all purchases, everything is straight to them. No middleman. Like we don't touch money. We cover shipping everything and we'll be at heroes con this year for the first time tabling, just trying to spread the awareness and word. So it'll be June 14th through 16th. And if y'all are curious about comics, curing cancer, feel free to let me know. Cause we're always looking for ways to get more, more people aware of it and raise money to kick cancer's ass. Cause it sucks. So we're going to get ready to wrap this up. Let me just share this real quick. Take one second. This is a, Free shipping anywhere in the world. You get those two trades and that first appearance of Red Coat. Going to one lucky winner. Just if you haven't read them, I'll give you the opportunity to read them. You know, every Tuesday we do the giveaway. This one's no different. Boom, 23 months. Congratulations. Okay. Nice. You know what to do. Hit me up on Instagram and I'll get those out to you. But yeah, definitely, definitely some cool stuff there. All right. You know, oh, nice. one, of, one of the things I just wanted to ask quickly because in in the ghost machine and you it's you permitted also were kind of for lack of a better term almost like your mission statement right you talk about um the future the future creators as well talk a little bit about that and, and how ghost machine is gonna part it's gonna be a part of that sure i'll let, I'll let jay or jay or brian handle that one um, hey, you can I, go jay yeah <laughs> I, I would just say like you know we we started off this um this company with uh, uh such a great group of people um you know a lot of a lot of us didn't know each other uh when we first really came together in new york there we all left you know really loving each other as mm -hmm. dear friends and uh with a lot of us it felt like it's like as if we knew each other forever it's like that's how close we became and that's that really i think is reflected in the work that we've been doing and how everybody really cares for each other's projects and and like even like I was reading Red Coat the other night, um, and uh, and I was just I was so proud of it, and even though I didn't work on it, I mm -hmm. I felt so right. proud of this book, and mm -hmm. I I I I was telling Jeff about this, like it it kind of like it moved me because I I was like I've never in my life felt felt that way about something that I didn't work on, but like I because I because I I consider you know, Jeff and Brian, like close friends of mine, I was, and, and the fact that I've been like hearing about these projects and, and hearing little tidbits and seeing Brian's pen, like Brian sends out all the pencil art to us so we can like, just take a look at it and like see his process. It, like, I just felt like I, I felt like I worked on it. I felt like mm -hmm. I was part of it in some way. And, and I was just so proud of it. And, and that's, that, that's the kind of, the, that's the kind of uh, passion that we all have for these books and these characters and and the things that we're doing and and in the future we 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 do hope to bring in more creators and and we want to bring in comic book creators who have that love passion uh, selflessness um, uh, team team players because uh, we really do see ourselves sure we're we're a company we but we we see ourselves as a true team. A family of people who are working to a common goal. We're working together. We're we're uh, helping to um, you know uh, lift each other up and and uh, you know give each other confidence and push forward and and you know uh, comic book creators out there like you know uh, if if any of you are watching uh, this what we have going on here is is the ultimate in comic books like this this is the ultimate like you have never seen or experienced anything like we're experiencing at dc at marvel you're just not and so when we come knocking on that door you know really think really think about this there's freedom mm -hmm. there's uh there's such a uh there, like th there's a burden that's kind of lifted off your back doing this kind of stuff. And you're just able to, it's, it's hard work though. I will say this, mm -hmm. it's hard. Uh, Brian can probably attest to this too. You're I, like, Rook is the hardest thing I've ever drawn in my life. Mm -hmm. And some days I sit there and I read the script and I, 
mumble under my breath like, "Oh my gosh, I got to do this." But but in I was the going end, through my I was going through the, the Jay. I was going through the the next script on Red Coat. And I was thinking, like, because sometimes to get going on something, you go for the easy pages. You look at the things that are oh, that one's straight for. That's only gonna take a few hours. You go through that. I go through the script. Nope. 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 <laughs> nope. Twenty-two times. No. Nope. <laughs> like, okay. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> There's no yeah. easy pages. We are gonna have a we are gonna have a snowstorm issue a la Alpha Flight with It's not just that though, it's it's, it's, it's things like because because there's um it, it, even even something as quietly, you know, a quiet page, a conversational page, it's not just the environment they're in, it's it's yeah. like Albert and Simon talking, for instance. There's there's so much physicality to each of their expressive natures and their acting that you, you can't there's no you know, stock poses, no superhero poses. You, you stre I'm stretching myself in ways I haven't for a long time. I mean, it was just a quiet conversation in a railway car between Albert and they're in the luggage car. And because obviously Simon isn't going to buy any tickets because he isn't going to any money. So that, you know, but they're in this luggage car. And, um, and apart from having to draw an enormous amount of luggage, the, the, the real joy in that was actually making the figures and the characters work. But, you know, I had to draw. And I was really pleased with how the, the Simon figures worked on that page, but those were not easy figures to draw because they're not in your stock footage repertoire, you know? So, yeah. Um, and drawing figures at rest um, naturally and with expression is far more difficult than drawing somebody leaping through a window. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what an iconic shot. And I saw that it made the T-shirt as well. So yeah. that's a good place to end it, guys. Check out Ghost Machine. Check out uh, your LCS tomorrow. If you don't have an LCS, get online and order them. You can go to ABX. They have a mailing list for subscribers if you want to get some books as well. The link is in the description mm -hmm. to a comic shop that you can find these books at. Also, check out their merch store. Like I've, I picked this up as soon as they announced it at the uh, at NYCC. I've got a cool hat. Mm -hmm. They have some fantastic designs. Like uh, Support the company because these are the kind of books that we want. We appreciate y'all being here. We're not going to take up any more of your time because we need y'all to make books for us. So I appreciate y'all <laughs> coming. And uh, thank you. guys, thank you, everybody in the incredible chat. We appreciate you coming out, hanging out, thank especially you. in your work. Dan, I know half of y'all had to quit your jobs to be here today, and we appreciate <laughs> that. So uh, until next time, as always, uh, I'm Mark, but we are Legion. Thank you, guys.